turn with me this morning in the Gospel of Mark. This is Matthew, Mark, second book in the New Testament. What I'm going to do is read part of a story and deal mostly with this one, the first part. And then at the end, towards the end, I'll read just the next story in, in this, instead of reading it all now and maybe lose tracking of what's happening. So Mark chapter 1, and uh, beginning at verse, I think I'll begin at verse 39. Mark one thirty nine. And as he was preaching in their synagogues throughout Galilee, and he was preaching, as Jesus is speaking about him, preaching in the synagogues throughout Galilee and casting out demons. And now in verse 40, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you no say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. And to spread the matter, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in desert, deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. The word of the Lord from here, and we'll read maybe a little bit more towards the end. So I just want to focus on this very short story, very, but it's packed, packed with meaning here this morning. And uh, it's found in three of the Gospels, in Matthew as well as Mark. And uh, Luke's gospel, so just uh, compare those. It's good to read through them and, and see what they had here. But um, uh, some nameless person somewhere along the line uh, developed what was called leprosy. In our day, it's a, it was a skin disease. Um, it could start out with a rash or something. The Bible doesn't even tell this guy's name or anything. But he's, he was identified by his illness. Notice that. It's called a leper came to Jesus, but that, that word leper is packed, is condensed, uh, a lot of what it means. Uh, people, it would affect your limbs. But anyway, let me back up a minute and just say that it began, if somebody showed a rash, the Old Testament, you can read about this in Leviticus 13, 14, probably some other places. Uh, and they would come to the priest and they were kind of, would check you out and check that spot on your skin or that rash. And they would quarantine you for a time. And if it didn't get any worse, and there were certain speculations that there are certain rituals they would go through to make sure that it wasn't spreading. And uh, if they noticed it wasn't spreading, you would be declared clean and you could enter back into society. But if, on the other hand, it began to grow worse, you would be actually, uh, for the sake of the community, taken out of the community and you would leave. And you find cases of this in the Old Testament of lepers who lived outside of the city. And mainly, partly because of uh, contagious as it was. But I just want to read to you just a little bit uh, from uh, uh, P.K. Harrison, uh, just a short description of this disease. I think you could put it a little better than I could. But he says, uh, a diagnosis with leprosy is as much a death sentence to the ancient Israelites as news about advanced malig malignancy uh, would be to the modern patient. Uh, a cancer diagnosis and so on. The diagnosis, the diagnostic guidelines furnished for the priest's uh, position would prevent him from being unnecessary uh, or bringing unnecessary sorrow and hardship to his countrymen, while at the same time ensuring the health of the community. Once a man was branded a leper, he had to adopt the posture of a mourner by tearing his clothes, uh, allowing his hair to become unkept covering his beard or mustache and crying unclean, unclean. And the exact, almost exactly those things if you read in Leviticus 13 and verse 45. But he had to live outside the camp, perhaps in a company with other lepers. But his existence was nothing more than a living death. Unless there was a quick remission of the disease, the victim of uh, 
clinical leprosy, knew that his condition would be a lengthy duration and that its loathsome nature would prohibit natural contact with society. Most of all, a leper would be cut off from the spiritual fellowship with the covenant people. In other words, he couldn't enter the temple. And in the real sense, he would be without hope and without God in the world. And that's his explanation of leprosy. It, uh, you had it. I've seen some gro- gruesome pictures of it. Now it affects your limbs, your nerves, and nerve endings, and so on. And uh, there were leper colonies throughout the world. Uh, and at this time, it was a horrible disease. So when we, we come to that word and we just simply read, oh, a leper came to Jesus. Uh, there's a lot, see, concentrated into that one word. It was an awful disease. And it knew no boundaries, just like cancer today, right? There's no social boundaries for it. Uh, you can be rich or poor and become a leper. Uh, you could uh, be a king. You could be the president of a country. Or you could be a pauper in it or a servant. And still this uh, disease could get you. And you, you would lose your standing. You lose your title. You lose everything. You lose your family. You're basically banished outside. I guess the families would often take care of them or at least leave food for them, but couldn't come in close contact with them. And so that was a way of keeping it from spreading as well in the community. So this was is this uh, what we read here. A leper came to him is packed with uh, a lot of behind it, uh, behind, uh, behind the scenes things going on. And it was common in that day and everybody knew it because you would actually see them probably every day in daily life there. If one came into the community and, for instance, and needed a drink of the water, he would cry and hold over there. He or she would cry and say, unclean, unclean, and people would turn around. They'd move. They'd clear out. You know, they could get a drink at the fountain or whatever, but then leave and so on. And, you know, the interesting thing about this man is that in Luke's gospel, it said the man was full of leprosy. So it wasn't a mild case here for this guy. This guy had given all hope that he was, he was just full of leprosy. I don't know, it doesn't tell us much more than that. Um, but he was. this man was conscious of his own condition. That's the first point I want to make here this morning. He was very conscious of the, the need that he had and the condition that he was in. And leprosy, we have another leprosy called leprosy of the soul. And it's a simple three-letter word that is sin. Uh, I call it often the cancer of the soul. Uh, that seeks to destroy us and, and to damn us. But uh, you see, when we have physical things like leprosy, if you had physical leprosy, that was something visible. You could actually see things and, and uh, know that this person has leprosy. Whereas when we talk about the cancer of the soul, it's not often visible. And so people, we have a hard time admitting we have a problem with sin. It's because uh, it's, it's less visible. Can you imagine what would happen to us if every time we told a lie or something, we'd lose a limb? My goodness, one preacher said we'd have to have a healing service every Sunday. <laughs> Think of that. I mean, if, if sin affected us like leprosy does and it's visible, if the moment you sinned or told a lie or took God's name in vain or something like that and you lost a limb for it, then it'd be obvious and you'd say, yeah, I guess I guess I have to admit, maybe you can't lift an arm. You say, I guess I have to admit I'm a sinner. And uh, so that's what I wanted to compare here as well. Uh, this morning as we look at this, that we see the effects of that. But this man could see his need and his need drove him to Jesus. It's his need that drove him to Jesus. And often I, I find that people will not go to Jesus unless there's a need, unless they see their own need for it. Um, and they could see the stru- true state of their soul. But uh, let me see here. This man came and looking in verse 40 with me. It says, now the leper came to him imploring him and kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And I just want to look at this a moment. He was so desperate. Look at his desperate measures he took. He said, it says when he came to Jesus, he implored him, he begged him. He begged him. Another thing he did was kneel down. And if you read Luke's or Matthew's account, I can't remember which one, he falls on his face in front of Jesus. And he begs him. He begs him. And what does he say in those other Gospels? He adds the word Lord to it. He says, Lord, if you can make me clean. If you're willing, you can make me clean. (laughs) Somewhere along the line, this guy heard about Jesus, right? It had to start somewhere. 
In Matthew's account, as he tells the story, uh, it comes, it's the first thing following the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I don't know if Jesus was up preaching on the Mount and there was a leper somewhere. He couldn't be in the company of the people, but on the outskirts where he could hear Jesus teach. I don't know. But somehow he heard about Jesus. It says in, in Mark's Gospel and in other places that he'd already healed uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law from a fever. That Jesus had cast out demons. But up until this point in this man's life, Jesus had never healed, never cured, or healed a leper. So this man has never seen a leper been cleansed before, but somehow he knew after either listening to Jesus or hearing about Jesus, he said, Jesus can do something for me. And he believed. He believed with all his heart. Ah. And so uh, he believed. And he absolutely convinced that Jesus could do it. He'd see, he just, something within him. The only thing he was wondering was, is he willing to do it? Is Jesus willing to make me clean? And, but I, I, what I want to stress here is, do you believe God can do something for you? I know a lot of people who are in love to some extent with Jesus. They read the Bible and they're fascinated by the stories and the healings and the different things that went on and how Jesus cared for people. But when it comes to push to shove, they, they don't believe that Jesus can do something for me. And see, this guy, this guy was beyond that. He knew the power of God, that God could do anything absolutely he wanted. But he, he knew also then that Jesus could do something for me personally. And so you find him desperate as he was. I mean, he looked, this was his only hope. Think of it. All of the, um, his hopes in, in anything he could do for himself were gone, vanished. I'm sure he tried everything he could to get rid of this leprosy, to have it. But he probably tried and washed and washed, and I don't know what he did, perhaps. But nothing availed. He tried it, and he was still a leper. He maybe tried doctors and things, but nothing happened. And so he's given up hope now for anything, any human help this side of eternity. And he's desperate and he hears about Jesus and this is his last hope. He says, and he believes with all his heart that God can do something for him. And I hope today you're here, any one of you and your kids too, that God, not only do you know that God can do something, not just head knowledge, but that God wants to do something for you. Hmm? That makes a difference in the world. That God actually cares about you. That God is concerned about you. And so this man comes and he falls before Jesus and he says, I know your power and so on. He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And look at the next words in verse 41. And I love this. Then Jesus moved with compassion. You went, this, this has meant more to me the last few mo months maybe. Jesus was moved with compassion. People get the idea that God is just stoic up there, has a straight face, frown, just waiting to squash you when you go wrong. <laughs> and yet, Jesus looks at this pitiful, pitiful creature in front of him, this man. And his heart goes out. After what Jesus saw with his own eyes and what he heard with his own ears, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. That touched the heart of God. Think of it. And there are many times in the Bible you can read through, through the New Testament. Try to find places, places where it says that Jesus had compassion for people. It's an amazing thing. One time was uh, not too, uh, a rich man came to Jesus. He was wealthy. And he comes to Jesus. He says, I want to know how I, can get in, how I can get eternal life. How do I receive eternal life? And he begins to ask Jesus, Jesus. And the first thing it says, one of the things before even Jesus spoke, he says, the Lord looking at him. Loved him. Loved him. Then we talked about not too long ago when Jesus fed the crowd of 5,000 people, but that was just the men, the women and children, probably numerous. And Jesus, when it says, when he got off the boat and he saw that number of people coming to him as sheep without a shepherd, he says he had compassion on them. Remember, he left the disciples. He told the disciples, we haven't had even time to eat. Let's go to a desert, deserted place somewhere and rest a while. And they get there, and there's this crowd of people that beat them to the shore. And they're waiting. They're so hungry spiritually. They want to know something. They, they believe God can do something for them. And so Jesus, when he gets there and he sees the massive people, first thing it says, he had his compassion for them. 
His heart was stirred for them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Nobody was leading. They had religious leaders in Israel that day. They had the temple. They had everything. But they were being led astray. He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so what did he come to be? He came to be our good shepherd, didn't he? And so he comes and there's this heart of compassion. And even Jesus, when he talked about the prodigal son in Luke 15, it says that when that son, after he squandered his father's living on on riotous living and on spending it on prostitutes and the whole thing. And his father saw him from a distance coming home. The first thing it says about him is, is, is he had compassion for him. And he ran to him, embraced him and kissed him and hugged him, welcomed him home. Aren't you glad God's compassionate? And two, now here comes today in our story as we read this, this true story that really happened. This leper came to Jesus. And after what Jesus saw and heard, he saw one individual. I mean, Jesus saw tons of people that day. But he makes a special point of this person and says, the Lord he, and felt compassion for him. He hears those words. He sees this man involved. He sees him kneeling with his face to the ground, utterly in humility recognizing his need of help. And he comes and he kneels. And to hear these words, he had compassion on him. It's an awesome thing. And the Bible tells us that God is compassionate. In Psalm 145, verse 8, it says this, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Great in mercy. Aren't you glad we have a God like this? This is the God of the Bible. And this is a God that we serve, the God we love. And not only did he have a heart of compassion for him, his heart was stirred at one individual, one individual. And I believe today, this morning, as God is here and looking down on you, just think of that. He has compassion on you here this morning. Not only did he have compassion on him, but Jesus did something that would shock anybody of that day. After the man said, Lord, if you're willing, you may be clean. It said Jesus had compassion for him, and he touched him. The man was in distance. I imagine when the man came and knelt before Jesus, the kind of the crowd kind of split apart, right? Made way for this leprous man. Nobody else wanted leprosy. This man really shouldn't have been there. But he's desperate, and he knows Jesus is coming, and he kneels before him. And he says, and it says that Jesus touched him. You know what's interesting to me? How many times in the Bible do you read where Jesus just spoke and people were healed? Wouldn't this have been a good time if it was you and me? I don't want to touch that guy or that gal. She has leprosy. Of if all if if if, if I was God, I'm, you can say amen that you're glad I'm not because I'm not. <laughs> uh, that you know I wouldn't have touched that person. I I don't want to be banished from my home. I don't want to get what he has. And yet here is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And he had compassion for that man, and he touches that man, whereas he could have just spoken the word. How do you think that man felt? How many years has it been since somebody touched him? Maybe there's a relative or family member that's not getting along with you, and you've last time you've spoken to them, and they're hurt. Or a departed loved one, you'd like just one more hug? It just Jesus looks at him, loves him, and he touches him. The man knows he smells, right? The man himself knows he's repulsive, and yet he comes anyway. Here's my only hope, my only chance. You know what? Think of this. He stood before the purest man that ever lived. He's standing before God himself, God in the flesh, the purest man that ever lived. And you know what? If you touched a leper, you yourself are considered unclean. What's that say about Jesus who never sinned? It speaks to me of a verse in the Bible. If I can find 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he was made sin who knew no sin. To be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. When Jesus touched him. He identified with our sin. 
What a story. Stretched out his hand and touched the man. You know, the man's faith, when I look at his faith and you see his trust in God, it was in God alone. His trust was in Jesus alone, nobody else. Look at the personal pronouns here. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He knew Jesus was the only one. Again, no shred of confidence in himself anymore. Nobody on earth could help him and deliver him from this. But his eyes and it were... Oh, the eyes of faith were fixed on Jesus. If you get to that point, it's a good point to be. Where you're focused only on Him and realize that only He can help you. I was listening to the radio this week. And a mother had called in to tell about her children not following the Lord and how bad she felt. But then she made this statement, something like that, along this line. Yeah, my children... I, uh, let me write, I wrote down roughly what it was said. Our kids are, uh, will have to find their own way to God. My wife and I found God through Jesus. Maybe they will find him some other way. No. No, the Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus himself said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father but by me. See, there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. I didn't say it. God said it. Jesus said it. The Bible says it. And these words are precious when you hear these words that Jesus spoke next. This man said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And to his utter thankfulness, he hears the word back. First words from Jesus' lips after he felt, I mean, as if the touch wasn't enough. As if if Jesus' heart of compassion wasn't enough, he touches the man. He says, I am willing. Be clean. Can you imagine what that man felt like? Everything, every ounce of hope that he had in Jesus was that moment fulfilled. Moment, the Bible says, instantly, right? As soon as he had spoken, in verse 42, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. It didn't take a long process, with, did it? Did his cure take long? Jesus say, oh, I want you to go out and say so many our fathers. I want you to Say so many prayers. I want you to help so many poor people. No. It happened like that. Jesus just simply, no sooner he got the words out of his mouth and that man looked at his skin and he was clean. No more leprosy. He's looking just amazed. Can you imagine? I'd love to have been there, wouldn't you? To see that. To see that man totally set free. Little did that man know what his words would mean to help people. How many, over 2,000 years ago, these words were spoken and yet they can help somebody here today. To know in your own heart that Jesus says, I'm willing. Maybe you've doubted that. I had an uncle that did on his deathbed. Doubted whether God would forgive him for the life he'd lived. I hope nobody waits that long (laughs) to give your life to Christ today. He says, I'm willing Be cleansed. And if you doubt it, it's written three times the story in the Bible. And if the first time after you read it, you have doubts, read it again in Matthew. You get those words again, I'm willing, be clean. And if there's still any shred of doubt, you get to to the Gospel of Luke and you hear again those words, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I'm willing, be clean. Isn't God good? Isn't it neat to see the heart of God that he is willing the Bible says people blame God for sending people to hell. Hey, it's the Bible says that God isn't willing that any should perish. But he is willing. What he is willing to do is to see all, all come to repentance. But you know what? Not all come to that place because we're stubborn. And so I'm willing to be clean. And you know what I can say now, I believe? This morning, like the heart of God as he looks down on this group of people and individuals and kids, his heart is touched with compassion. And he knows your need and he'll touch you. And he will make you clean and make you whole. Lord, I believe you can make me clean. You know, Jesus didn't come, and I have to say this, just I hope you understand me. Jesus didn't primarily come 
to heal our bodies of physical diseases. Though he did. He did. He said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted, cast out demons and different heal the sick. So he did come for that. But that was not his primary, his primary mission on life. His primary mission is to open our eyes to our need of a Savior. To expose our hearts of sin and say, I need help. And let me just finish by reading and I'll briefly go through this story in two because we've been here. But let me, chapter two of Luke, um, I mean, I'm sorry, Mark, as we just continue just a little bit further, we'll see the God's primary stop. And he entered Capernaum and after some days it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. So Jesus is expounding the scriptures to the people, and there's a multitude of them. Uh, Then they came to him and bringing a paralytic, a man who was a cripple, kids. There was a kid, guy who couldn't get to Jesus. He had no way to get there. His feet, legs didn't work. And so four of his friends said they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they they broken through, they let down the the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there. Those are the religious people were reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins, but God alone. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they had reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason thus within your hearts? These things in your heart. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, to the crippled man, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose, took up his bed and went up in the presence of them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, We never saw anything like this before. Wow. But this explains the very purpose of God. He came to heal the sick. But what was his main purpose? What's his main purpose in this lesson? The man's greatest need is to have his sins forgiven. And when those friends finally broke through that roof, and I don't know what a service, can you picture somebody that's having a service here? This was in a house, and somebody's breaking through the roof because they couldn't get through the doors. They found their way to the attic, and finally they... Start ripping them. I mean, stuff falling down in people's hair. Come on, picture this. The eyes, people are starting to rub their eyes from all the dust coming off that roof as they begin to open it up. And then wide enough to drop this leper down in his bed. I mean, leper, uh, this paralytic. And set him in front of Jesus. What's the first thing Jesus said to him? Son, your sins are forgiven you. Man, not only that, but just to prove it to the people. And that's the lesson here. Just to prove that I have power on earth to forgive sins. Man, take up your bed and walk. Go home and everybody's, oh, wow. I never saw anything like that before. But don't lose. Jesus came, load of people. What did he do? He preached the word to them. In Mark's gospel, the first chapter, verse 14 and 15, he says that Jesus came preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins. That's what he came to preach. And so that's what I believe he was preaching in the house and preached everywhere he went. And they let this man down and he sees their faith. He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. That is the greatest thing you can have ever said. You know what the Bible says and come close to Christmas time? Joseph was to, and Mary were to name their child Jesus. Why? Because it is he who will save his people from their sins. And what do I have to do then? What do I have to do to get eternal life? What do I have to do to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven? Number one, can I just say this from our story here today? You've got to see your need. That you're in desperate need of help. That your sin is killing you. Strangling you. And the Bible says if we die in our sins, there's no hope. In the life to come, it's eternity in heaven. And Jesus is willing when he sees us and we admit our need and come to him, he freely forgives us. Isn't that neat? All we have to do is repent. You know, and that's what the cross, let me just briefly say this. I say this so often, but I don't want to, it's not trite. When we see a bloody figure on the cross, 
He was dying there for Dan Breckner. He was dying for every lie that you and I have ever told. And who should be on that cross? Because Jesus couldn't just wipe our sin under a rug and say, I forgive you. God, Remember, God is just. And he has to punish sin. If he's just, he has to punish it. And he took it out on his son. And that's what the cross was doing. And so when I look at the cross, I see somebody dying in my place where I should have been because I sinned. And yet he paid my fine for me. Why? So that if I believe that and I turn from my sins and I put my confidence, my trust in God, in him alone, that what he did on the cross is enough to save me. I'm not going to heaven because I'm good. I'm not. I'm going to heaven is because the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me from all sin. And you can have the forgiveness of your sins and go to heaven. So take care of that. That's God's primary concern for each individual here, for each kid, for each woman, each mother, father, grandmother, grandfather. Our greatest need is to have our sins forgiven. And today Jesus is looking down with compassion on us. And I believe he's touching you today. And I remember saying that in a meeting one time in Macedonia as I was preaching. And a man couldn't wait to get done. He said like a fire burning inside. He wanted to give his life to Christ right then and that. But he could hardly contain himself. Until we were finished with the service. He came running up to the front to receive Christ. And that man's sins were forgiven that moment. That moment. Can you imagine what it was like for this paralytic if he could visit us today? And he's been in heaven for a long time. But imagine if he showed up this morning and said, hey, I just want to tell you the story that happened here is really true. It was me that it happened to. You just imagine all of us just geeking at him. <laughs> and he'd be telling, you know, the time that Jesus healed him. And he said, yeah, I got more than I bargained for. He, I didn't understand it maybe that my sins were forgiven and understood all of that. But he said, I don't have time to tell you this morning how how it restored me to my family and restored me to health and all of the things, the benefits that he had. But he could say, you know, I've been in heaven for a long time with Jesus. And of those two blessings, he said, I got two blessings that day. Number one, my body was healed. But number two, my soul was healed. My sins were forgiven me. And I can tell you, if he was standing here today, he'd say the same. Say, of those two blessings, the blessing of having my sins forgiven was far better. And having my body healed. Why? As because we live this life. This life is short, isn't it? The Bible says it's like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Everybody in this room probably knows somebody who died this last year. And I've had friends more and more. The older I get, the more that I know to die. This life is short. And yet we've got all eternity to look forward to. And if we repent of our sins and put our faith in Him today, We'll walk out of here. Don't wait. Don't wait. Come to Jesus today. If I could say anything in closing, it'd be come to Jesus today. Don't say tomorrow or I'll wait till I'm stronger. I'll wait till this. Come now. Come today as you are. And I want to close in time of prayer and I'll just leave you to talk. Uh, I guess today, before the service started, I, I, I got the greatest news that could ever happen and before a preach or before a service starts. But Chris Dodlin came up to me Today and he said, you know, I uh, it was maybe a few weeks ago and he came forward to talk to me and he says, I'm not born again yet. But today he came up to me and said, this week I gave my life to Christ. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. This is where the rubber meets the road. Man. This is someone here among us that got right with God this week. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that when one sinner is healed of leprosy, all heaven rejoices. No. That when some person here on earth is healed of cancer, all the angels rejoice in heaven. It doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? The Bible says that there's joy in the presence of the angels in heaven over just one. One sinner who does what? Repents. See why sin and repentance is so important? This is what heaven rejoices about. And this week when, when Chris got right with God and made his peace with God, I don't know if you realized it or not, but somewhere up in heaven, there's a party going on. <laughs> and there ought to be celebration today. And we do celebrate. That's why I tell you, this is awesome news. This is what makes us real. So if there's anyone else, let's just close in a time of prayer. I don't want to 
leave you just here and we'll go downstairs and, and, and have a meal briefly. But I, I, I want to, let's take just a few moments, let this sink in. If you want to get right with God, you don't know what to say. Say what's on your heart. He knows what you're going through. Just tell him. It's not a long, drawn-out process or anything. This man just said, Lord, if you're willing, you can cleanse me. And immediately he said, I'm willing to be cleansed. That was it. Done. So let's pray. Just talk to God yourself. And if you're already cleansed in your heart, thank Him for it. Spend a time of thanksgiving. Father, I thank you that you have a heart of compassion, first of all. I, I'm so grateful, Lord, that your mercy extended even to me. As a song says, the vilest offender who truly believes the moment, this moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. It doesn't take long to tell a guilty sinner that he's been pardoned. Thank you, Jesus, for your pardon, for your love for us. Now, Lord, help us just to live for the one who died for us and rose again. Thank you, Lord, that you touch lives here this morning, I believe. That that is your heart and your desire. Is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We thank you, Lord. Lord, you're more real to me than the people in front of me. I pray you become real. To each one here in a great way. Thank you for friends and family. Thank you for the family of God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all of your blessings this day. Would you be glorified in all that we do and say the rest of this week. Lord, touch our lives. May we live for you all the days of our life. Starting today, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for the cross and all that it meant. And for your great, great love towards us. I praise you in Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen. Amen. And the Lord bless you. I know he, his heart is for you. And he causes his face to shine upon you, wants to bless you. Just live for the one who died for you and rose again. God bless you all this week and thanks for coming. You're always welcome.